Good afternoon, and welcome to the Cathedral of St. Philip and our midday meditation. My name is Kathy Zappa, and I'm canon for liturgy and pastoral care at the Cathedral, and I'm glad you are here. Today is June 25th, 2020, and it's the feast day of civil rights leader, poet, and educator James Weldon Johnson, whom I'll say more about in a moment. But first, let us pray. Eternal God, who gave your servant James Weldon Johnson a heart and voice to praise your name in verse. As he gave us powerful words to glorify you, may we also speak with joy and boldness to banish hatred from your creation. In the name of Jesus Christ, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns, one God, forever and ever. Amen. So who was James Weldon Johnson? He was born in 1871 in Jacksonville, Florida, and was raised by parents who had lived in the North and were well-educated and had never been enslaved. Thus, Johnson grew up in broadly cultured and economically secure surroundings, which was unusual among Southern Black families at the time. He attended the segregated Stanton School, where his mother taught, and which ended with eighth grade. So to continue his education, he moved to Atlanta and attended Atlanta University. There he earned his BA. He spent summers teaching black school children in rural Georgia and first became aware of the depth of the racial problem in the United States which was the subject of much of his poetry during this time. After college, he returned to Jacksonville as principal of his alma mater, the still segregated Stanton School. He also became an active local spokesman on racial, social, and political issues. At the same time, as if that weren't enough to keep him busy, he studied law and became the first black lawyer admitted to the Florida bar since Reconstruction. It was also during this time, his tenure at Stanton, around 1899, that he penned the words to one of my favorite hymns, perhaps one of your favorite hymns too, Lift Every Voice and Sing with his brother Rosamond drafting the music as he went. You feel the power of this hymn when you hear it, of course, but to really grasp its power, I think it's helpful to remember its context as well. This was just two decades after the Reconstruction Era, during Jim Crow, and lynchings were on the rise when Johnson was asked to address a crowd for Lincoln's birthday. Instead of a speech, though, he decided that he would write a poem. He always appreciated the power of art to express the inexpressible and to transform, to move people and societies. And he sought through this poem to uplift black communities still healing from slavery, to illuminate the suffering they had endured for generations, and to evoke their ancestors' strength and resilience and hope. It was a moving experience to write this poem, and apparently he cried his way through it. The song was performed the following year by a choir of 500 school children at the still segregated Stanton School, and it took off as a rallying cry for Southern Black communities, and many others joined in this cry. The hymn was embraced by churches and performed at graduation ceremonies and in school assemblies. And within about 20 years, the NAACP adopted it as their official song and dubbed it the Black National Anthem. The song has marked several celebrations since then, several lamentful and hopeful moments in history from the civil rights movement of the 60s and 70s to Maya Angelou's personal protest against discrimination at her school to Barack Obama's inauguration. 
Students at Howard University prayed and sang this song after Trayvon Martin's shooting. Beyonce paid tribute to it when in 2018 she became the first black woman to headline at the huge, predominantly white Coachella Music Festival. Most recently, Google played it. Google played it for Juneteenth just last week. And we sing it at the cathedral. We sing it many times during the year, but I'm struck especially when we sing it at our annual homeless requiem in the midst of anger and sadness, maybe even despair, um, sorrow about homelessness in this city and so many who have died on the streets. In the midst of that, we come together and lift our voices and sing the song of truth, the song of defiance, of faith and hope. And before I ever knew the song's history, I could feel it. I could feel the hope in it, the protest in it. I could feel the sadness and the resistance and the uplift in this song. Lift every voice and sing till earth and heaven ring. Until earth and heaven ring. This is a song for the in-between, for the times in between lament and praise, between anger and fear and hope, between what is and what can be. It's a song of encouragement and celebration, not celebrating because the work is done, because we have arrived where we want to be, where we need to be, but celebrating that we are on the way, that God is at work, that hope persists, and so we march on. James Weldon Johnson marched on too. In 1901, on the tales of the success of this song, he moved to New York with Rosamond to work as a composer and lyricist for Broadway. He studied creative literature, became active in the Republican Party, and was appointed as consul in Venezuela and then Nicaragua. He wrote more and more poetry along with a novel called The Autobiography of an Ex-Colored Man. He worked for the NAACP for about 15 years as field secretary and then as executive secretary during those really critical post-war years. And he kept writing. He marched on and he wrote on. He kept writing his own poetry and books, but he also kept lifting up, seeking to preserve other black literary and musical traditions and contributions to American literature. He published two collections of Negro spirituals and a collection called American Negro Poetry. And he published his own series of poems called God's Trombones. They're a fascinating series of seven poems which captured the style, the feeling of some of the fiery sermons that Johnson heard in rural black churches. For Johnson, you see, art mattered. Black art mattered, black artists mattered. And preserving and winning recognition for black cultural traditions was one of the ways that Johnson sought to protect the dignity of all people, to lift up his people who were suffering and to instill them with pride and self-confidence. At this point, I've talked a lot and I've just scratched the surface of this saint's life and work. The saint who commends to us the transformative power of art, of poetry, of song. There's much more I could say, of course, but sometimes it's just best to be quiet and let art do its work. And so I'd like to close by praying the words of lift every voice and sing. This song, this prayer for in-between times like our own. And this song that transforms us as we can pray it together. Let us pray. Lift every voice and sing till earth and heaven ring. Ring with the harmonies of liberty. 
Let our rejoicing rise high as the listening skies. Let it resound loud as the rolling sea. Sing a song full of the faith that the dark past has taught us. Sing a song full of the hope that the present has brought us. Facing the rising sun of our new day begun, let us march on till victory is won. Stony the road we trod, bitter the chastening rod, felt in the days when hope unborn had died. Yet with a steady beat have not our weary feet come to the place for which our fathers sighed. We have come over a way that with tears has been watered. We have come treading our path through the blood of the slaughtered. Out from the gloomy past till now we stand at last where the white gleam of our bright star is cast. God of our weary years, God of our silent tears, thou who hast brought us thus far on the way, thou who hast by thy might led us into the light, keep us forever in the path we pray. Lest our feet stray from the places, our God, where we met thee, lest our hearts, drunk with the wine of the world, we forget thee, shadowed beneath thy hand, May we forever stand, true to our God, true to our native land. Amen.